to be here tonight. Uh, Jamie Ellis is my name, uh, and I'm going to share some testimony with you. Um, it's uh, the little prayer of the group that we had right here to start with. It, it started off with how I'm going to start my night off, and that's with humbleness, because I am so humbled that I am here sharing my testimony and being able to give glory to God before you. Because um, about eight, 16 to 18 months ago in my life, there is no way that I would be standing here before you giving the Word of God to you. Because my Saturdays, my Saturday nights were not just Saturday nights. And Saturday would start off about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, and it'd start off with a line of cocaine to get the day going. And the cocaine would lead up to the first beer by about noon. And oh, by this time, we were well on our way. Yeah, we didn't have 10 or 12 under ourselves and a little bit of marijuana along the way to take the edge off. And just depending on who was hanging around with me that day, it might go on into the night. We might end up drinking liquor, whatever it was, to keep the night going. But so the first thing I want to do is that uh, there's a lot that's come along to change my Saturday nights. And I want to share a passage of scripture right off the bat with you, and I'm, I'm going to reference this scripture a few times as I, as I give this testimony, but I'm going to read from you from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew in me a right spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. <coughs> this passage is, as I said, this is what has changed my Saturday nights. Um, to give a testimony, I think it's essential for you to know a little bit more about me and what's came up into my life. My introduction was, was kind of the beginning of it. Um, as a child, I grew up in a church. Um, it, was, it was kind of an odd situation. Uh, my parents didn't go to church, but my father would take me to my grandmother's house, his mother, and I would go to Sunday school with her. And my father would spend the time riding around with his buddies and drinking beer while I was in Sunday school. But he was always there to pick us up, my sister and I, as she came along afterwards. But I spent my, up into my teen years in the church, loving Jesus, loving the church, loving what it was all about. But as the teen years come along, obviously we get a lot of temptations and things come our way. I'm sure we've all been there as older adults, and we've got some teens here that will be facing these things as they, as they go through these years. And, um, of course, alcohol... Marijuana at the time uh, were things that entered into my life. Bad timing 
with the church as our church split apart. Uh, it's, always, it's always a tragic story when churches get divided, but it wasn't the time for a teenager to see people arguing in the church. Um, this was also about the time when my grandmother passed away. So the things that had drawn me there had left me. And we make a lot of decisions in life. You know, we're, 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 it's a journey. And often that journey is about fitting in and doing what other people want us to do or what we're lured. Who do we want to be friends with? What group do we want to hang out with? And, you know, as a teen, that was what I went through. Um, but as we moved on, and of course we became successful in life, uh, I went on to college, uh, graduated college, got a degree, became an, started my own business, successful. Have a beautiful wife, with two loving daughters that are mean the world to me. Um, but there was something missing. With all these things that seem to be, be good in life, uh, the successes that I've had, there was something missing. And that was the Word of God. God was missing in my life. Despite the financial success that I had achieved, uh, being a, a good kid in school, uh, making good grades, getting a degree in college, God was missing. And, you know, we go back in time, and, and a lot of this sounds like, well, this guy doesn't have a lot to say. Man, he, he went through a lot of good things. Where, where's, his, where's, where's the humbleness here? Where's his troubles? Well, as I said, it, it, it wasn't a perfect story here by any means. Um, when we flash back to those teen years, I can remember um, 16 years old, got my driver's license. As I said, we were out of time and stage where alcohol uh, and, and marijuana primarily were the things that were there for us as teens. And um, the, first, the first Friday night that I was out on my own, we had a group in our school that had a band, so Southern Rock Band, Mason Dixon Band. Um, we were all going to see them. But the uh, Franklin County, uh, what was that, the community center or something? Yeah. Yeah. Been there, he's been there, he remembers. Sure, <laughs> well, got there. You know, the thing back then, as a teenager, you could go up to the to the old look, the ABC store, and all you had to do was find one of those bums that was hanging out. Yeah. They would get you a fifth. You give them a couple of bucks, and whatever you wanted, you had it. So me and my buddies, we you know we had to have Jack Daniels. I mean that was yeah. that was what, what was the thing, you know. But when we got there, and they I, they had they had that old moonshine, mm. and I've seen my daddy turn that fruit jar up. Seen him do it many times. I figured I could do it. If Daddy could do it, boy, I knew I could do it. So I turned it up. And if there was ever a night in my life that there was an angel on my shoulder, it was that night. Because how I made it home alive, I have no idea. I can remember coming out that Route 108. I had a, my first car was a 73 Dodge Charger. Now, I'm fortunate that I still have it because it's a wonder that it didn't get totaled that night. But I can remember that car waking up and being on the side of the hill. And somehow, I got guided back down to the road. Got a little further home, I can remember. Chat Moss, Texaco, hitting the curving in front of that place as I dozed off again. So somehow, somehow, there had bound to have been an angel guiding that wheel and getting me home, because I did not have the capabilities to do it. Um, you know, so there was a lot of things there. You know, as I said, from the standpoint of the, the things that we did, the, why did we do these things? Because the friends pulled us into them. Well, after going through this, it wasn't a real rosy situation. My mother was not very happy with me, obviously. Uh, that, that driver's license that I had worked so hard to get, you just lost it for 30 days. Well, the next thing ensued was uh, getting into some fights in school, getting suspended in school. But I smartened up. I smartened up. I, I said, no more smoking pot, put that away, straightened my life up, got back to making good grades in school and, and, and moved on. Graduated fourth in my high school class. If I hadn't uh, messed up then and had some grades that weren't so good, I might have graduated a little higher. Moved on to college, though. Alcohol was still prevalent, though. 
alcohol was still part of our life. I was the last 18-year-olds in the state of Virginia that was legal to drink. So even at the age of 18, we were, I was legal. I could, we could drink all we wanted. Um, as college years came along, uh, still we were a lot of drinking going on. And uh, about a year into college, I met up with some other guys. Once again, here we go. Are we going to fit in? Are we going to make new friends? And it was back to using marijuana again. And as I graduated, went through school, you know, I always get stayed focused enough. These things were things that, they were recreational. They had their place. But as, as I moved on into life, as I got out of school, these things, these habits went with me. Um, as, we, as, as I started my business, so, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of money to be buying marijuana. It was, you know, something that if I did get it, it was a luxury. But as financial success came along, um, we became open to it. It became easier to obtain. It became where I was given the opportunity to have excellent marijuana, do it, you know, and, and we parted with friends. That was the thing. As often when it comes to facing these challenges in life, and as we go walk down this road, as we go down this journey, along the line I got introduced to cocaine. One of my best friends said, hey, we would go fishing together. We would go to races together. Um, we were going to fishing, going to Hatters. He said, so he introduced him. Man, we can do this. We can drive all night. We can drink all day. And I bought into it. It became just a, a special occasion type thing initially. It was one of those things. It wasn't something I had to have day in, day out. I wasn't addicted to it. But it did become eventually an obsession. As financial success became, it was one of those things that, to me, alcohol and cocaine, they were hand in hand. They're like milk, milk and cookies. They just went together. And I didn't want one without the other. So it became an obsession to always have it. Although it was, okay, I just wanted a little for Friday night or for Saturday night. And then I could put it away. But back in 2006, the friend that introduced me to cocaine... In the process of purchasing, I guess, close to an ounce of cocaine over the weekend, it was for myself, him, some other people. He didn't show up with it. My friend overdosed on cocaine that weekend. From Friday night to Monday morning, he came within a couple of grams of doing an entire ounce of cocaine. He was like a brother. Closest thing I ever had to a brother. I got a younger sister, but he was the closest thing. We did a lot of things together. We had a lot of fun during those times. And you would think, and you would think that losing your best friend would have been enough to say, I've got to put this out of my life. But it wasn't. No. Didn't do it. I said, he, 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 it was different with him. He had a true addiction. His joke was that this stuff goes bad. We've got to do it all. We can't save any for tomorrow. I wasn't like that. So even despite losing a friend to a drug overdose, I continued on. This friend was a source. And, of course, once he was gone, my friends and others that were partaking, we, you know, we had to look for other, for other options as the suppliers. And as we know, in the drug trade, you've, you, sometimes you don't always meet the best people. You meet some, uh, some less than desirable characters. And um, the next step in my life was, was due to, to the people that I had associated with. You know, I said God was missing in my life. Well, about a little over 16, 17 months ago, the hand of God came knocking on my door. And the hand of God was in the form of our local sheriff's department, presenting me with an indictment for the distribution of cocaine. I, I was blown away. What? Me? This can't be. I, I'm not a drug dealer. What, what, what do you mean? This, it, something's wrong here. You know, in, in my mind, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, 
okay, you know, it's a, a small group of friends here, you know, I'm not out on the street corner, but yes, sure, some of those guys, when we got stuff, they would get a little bit, and yes, money did change hands, but a deal, I'm not a drug dealer. So God was slapping me in my face really hard. I was faced with shame, embarrassment. Um, my two daughters were getting ready for school that morning. And there's never been any greater shame and pain in my life than when I was escorted out of my own home. And the only thing that didn't make it quite as bad was that officer was kind enough that he didn't handcuff me until he got me in the car. He said, I didn't want to do this in front of your children. And I was so thankful for that, for that, just for that little bit. But here I was, a complete failure to my family, I felt as if I was. I mean, it was just, as I said, the most embarrassing thing. I was a successful businessman. I, con I contributed to charities in our, in, our, in our community. I did things for groups. I gave money. I sponsored ball teams. You know, this can't be me. What have I done? What, have, what mistake have I made here? You know, we, we, we almost felt as if we were invincible, that we were above it all. We didn't feel like we were really doing anything wrong. But if you're young and out there, let me let you know what the definition in the eyes of our legal system is for distribution. If I was to roll a joint right now and hand it to you and you partake in it, our legal system sees that as distribution. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Of course, I didn't, never thought about that. Never, never would have imagined it. So being as low as I possibly could What's going to bring me out of this? Well, there was three things. Immediately, I went cold turkey. Alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, everything was put out of my life that day. I had been clean and sober since that day, mid-September of 2012 now. The second thing was my wife's faith. We had children. My first daughter was born in 1994. My second daughter was born in 2000. She became a mother, and, and her faith grew from then. She became much closer to God. She was in church every Sunday. She had her girls in church every Sunday. Uh, would I go? Occasionally. Occasionally I would, just because I felt it was my duty to be there, to go with my family, maybe once a month. Did I want to be there? No, probably because I had a, a hangover from Saturday night. But I got up and went just to make my wife happy, to make my girls happy. When my girls said, Daddy, we want you to come to church with us. So I was there. And the third thing was abundant life. In the process of seeking legal counsel to deal with these charges that I was facing, um, my, my lawyer said, you need to seek counsel." You need to get some treatment. You need to be proactive. If you want to have a chance of, get, of getting these charges behind you and regaining your life, you can't just wait for things to fall. You've got to move yourself. At this point, I was already about six weeks, seven weeks sober. He gave me a facilities number in Greensboro that I called, and I told the lady my situation, what was going on in my life, and she said, you haven't had a drink in seven weeks or whatever it was at that time. I was, I was counting days and weeks at that time. And I said, no, ma'am, I, I, I haven't had, had a drink in, in whatever that time frame was. And she said, well, I don't know if you qualify for our program. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, that's a, a kick in the face. She said, well, we'll be glad to talk to you. Well, I brought this home to my wife, and she said, would you be willing to talk to Dr. Chad? My wife had gone and visited with him on several occasions with two teenage daughters. Obviously, there were things that she brought with, to Dr. Chad, just family issues that she wanted to deal with. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And as I started, you know, it was Psalm 51. That's where we started this thing out. And I'm going to refer back to Psalm 51 again because Psalm 51, verse 10 
was create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And that was the first step. That was asking God to give me that clean heart. It became my crutch. It became what I, I leaned on. When temptation in life or something walked by me, a lustful eye of uh, somebody drinking, create me a clean heart, of God. Give me that right spirit, Lord. That was the first step. That was the first step. <clears throat> Get Check my notes here, see where I'm at. Um, you know, it's... It's always a struggle when you've, when you've had success and now that you feel like a complete failure. You know, as I said, the, the biggest failure to me was to my children. I went and apologized to both of my daughters individually for what I had done. Embarrassment if I caused them. Apologized to my mother, which was probably as equally as difficult. But to my girls, it was much, much closer to my heart because as a parent, they were the ones, they're teenagers. They're the ones supposed to be screwing up, not their father, not their dad. But, you know, the next step is forgiveness. It's forgiveness. And, and, and my, my oldest daughter was a senior in high school at this time. She's, she's a beautiful young girl, dedicated to the Lord, smart. She's in college right now, her freshman year, made the dean's list. I just, she's, she's wonderful. She's involved in Christian activities already, witnessing to, to people on her inner dormitory hall already, doing the work of Christ. But she was, had asked me to escort her two days on the Friday night. They knocked on my door. God knocked on my door that Wednesday morning. Two days after that, I was supposed to escort her in the Friday night football game before a crowd of who knows how many people that had just seen my name in the paper. That Thursday, I asked my daughter, I said, Honey, I said, do you still want me to escort you? She looked at me and she said, Daddy, why wouldn't I? She had already forgiven me. She had already forgiven me. So it's forgiveness. Then that forgiveness is there. I mean, we can, we can look at, at Psalms. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know, we, we go to God and we say, Lord, don't kick me out, Lord. Don't leave me. Don't leave me, Lord. But I think another... Another verse that I want to share with you is in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 17. This is when we're dealing with the fall of Israel here. Verse 17 reads, Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall they have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For every one is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So no matter what we do in life, no matter what mistakes we make, no matter how bad they are, no matter how bad we stumble, God's hand is out there. All we've got to do is take it. It's like we were talking about earlier. His hand is outstretched for us at all times. And sometimes it is just so hard for us to reach out and say, Lord, let me take your hand. You know, we've got a lot of successes and failures that I've talked about, and we all go through these things in life. And um, you know, if we if we're if, if through life as we grow up, we you know if we compete in sports or we got a favorite team, when we win, our team wins. Man, we're we're glad to talk about it. You know, as we go through school grades and such things, successes. Oh man, you want to brag about it, but boy, if your team loses, you don't want to tell them the score. You don't want to even talk about it. And if you made bad grades as a kid and you got a bad report card, the last thing you want to do is brag about you is hiding it from your parents. You know, and that's where 
That's where that 13, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's where it is. Just begging of God to be there for us. Don't kick me to the, don't kick me to the curb, Lord. Don't, leave, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, we, we as humans have nowhere near the forgiveness that God offers to us with that outstretched hand. We, we hold grudges. People do something against us. And, and I grew up, you know, I grew up, as I said, you know, my father drank, my mother didn't, and my dad, he worked hard. But, you know, there was nights where he would go out with his friends and get drunk. And it was, you know, my mother would get mad and, and she, would, she wouldn't speak to him for weeks. You know, there was no forgiveness there. But I was fortunate that my family forgave me. The, I, in my business, I've got six, seven employees. My employees stood by me. They didn't quit and leave my company. They, they supported me. They forgave me. And if we read from Matthew chapter 6, verses 43 and 44, the words of Jesus Christ tell us, Ye have heard that it, that, it, that it hath been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know, you would think, going through what I went through, I will say that I was set up. Uh, the guy that I dealt with in purchasing cocaine came back to me, put set me up. And you would think that you would be just have all the hatred in the world that, that I had to go through what I did because this guy was simply just trying to lessen his sentence. He had already been busted. But it was a blessing. It was the greatest blessing that I ever received because it gave me the out. It gave me that time, that opportunity to take God's outstretched hand. Mm -hmm. And that was the next thing that meant so much to finding God was my, my church family. And, you know, to have such kind of charges placed against you it puts it makes you an outcast. I mean, it definitely it, people look at you and like, how in the world? What are you doing? Are you out here on the street selling drugs to our children? And people people judge. We you know that that's just in just as in Psalm fifty one tells us, the only one I've sinned before is God. But our church family was so great. They reached out. They supported me. Our pastor. We met in my. We met with him. I met with Doctor Chad. I, I joked with them that. They were talking to each other. I knew that they were talking to each other because on Sunday night, my pastor Tim, he would, he would, or Sunday morning, he would be reading some scripture and he would have some lessons. I talked to Dr. Chad on Wednesday night and he would be coming up with the same thing. I'm like, you guys are working together. What's going on here? Y'all tag teaming me. But it was nothing more than the word of God. It was God working, reiterating what Tim said on Sunday, what Dr. Chad backed up on Wednesday. They were working, and God was working in me. And without anyone's knowledge, other than my pastor, on the 27th of January in 2013, just a little over a year, on that Sunday morning, when the hand was extended, I walked up, and I gave my life to Christ. It's, it's just like Psalm 51 tells us. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise these. And I came before the congregation that morning with a broken heart and a broken spirit asking God to heal me. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, when I came out of that water, people talked about finding the Holy Spirit. Man, there was a joy in my life that 
I just never, never realized, never felt. And I still had a long ways to go. My legal battle went on for only God's hand stepped in. Dr. Chad kept telling me, there's a delay in this because God has something he wants to happen. There was so much that went on. And when it all came down, I'm here before you. Because God had a plan for me. And this plan is obviously starting right here tonight. Because this is the first real opportunity that I've had. I have spoken, I have witnessed before our youth group at church. Uh, we had some camp outs and stuff. That we uh, had them out and, they, and, I, and I went before these group of just all teens. And, you know, talked about not in great detail that I went into tonight. But still with uh, some, of, some of these details, but not quite as much as y'all have, 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 have had the burden of listening to me tell you. <laughs> but, you know, having the Holy Spirit working in you that I can't wait to be at Rich Acres Christian Church tomorrow morning at 8.30 for early service. Can't wait. I mean... My wife and I are planning to, to go to Durham next week to see a show. And she said, are we coming home? So I said, yeah, we're coming home. We're going to be at church Sunday morning. No problem. You know, there's no drinking going on. I don't have any problems going to do something that we may want to do. Spending a night with my wife and coming out and coming back home and, and being up to be there for that 8.30 early service. Um, you know, when we walk alone, Man's will versus God's will. When we walk alone, our decisions, and we talked about this, that was just brought up in our in the, in the Bible, in the study session before, that we make poor decisions, don't we? But when we take God's hand, when we take that outstretched hand, boy, it makes a difference. I know it's made a difference in my life. And when we choose God's will, over our will, our life rewards are going to be great. I'd just like to close with praying with y'all if y'all will, will honor me with closing out this testimonial with a word of prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come before you giving all the glory, all the glory, all the thanks, and the forgiveness, Lord, thanking you for that forgiveness that forgiveness that we often don't feel we're worthy of. And we aren't truly worthy. We're not worthy of the blood of Jesus Christ. You gave your Son for our salvation. But Lord, we know that you want us to have that salvation, that you want us to take your outreached hand so that we can enjoy and have the Holy Spirit moving within us so that we can do your work so that we can walk as your son walked in his likeness. Lord, just thank you so much for this opportunity to bear witness for you. It is so important. And I just ask, Lord, that if, if my story makes a difference in someone's life, Lord, that you would just bless them and that it will lead and guide us in your direction, dear Lord. Lord, just thank you so much, so much for your love and mercy. I do ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you.